so. All right, you guys ready? Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Again, once again, my name is Diallo. Thank you for joining me today on this beautiful Monday morning, September 28th, 2020. It was a very, very exciting weekend this weekend for many people around. And by excited, I don't mean happy. I just mean uh, excited as in lots of things going on excited. Like if a molecule was excited, it moves around a lot. And there's lots of other things going on. So these, these, these things that went on are both good and bad or neither. They just happened. They just happened because sometimes on earth, things happen, right? Houses burn, people pass away, people get rich, people lose their job, people get hired. That's just the way the world works. So we're doing, again, current events today. And today is lucky enough to be, again, Monday, September 28th, 2020. Wow. Well, so when you were 30, when you were 20 years old, did you ever think about 2020? Like, what would it be like in 2020? Yeah. Ever? I didn't even think that either. I'm 32 now. And I didn't, when I was 20 years old, I didn't even think about 2020. Mm -hmm. 2020, that seems like such a long ways off, but yet it got here so fast. You're only how old? 32, actually 33. No, I turned 34 next month. October 3rd is my birthday. October 3rd is my birthday. It is. That's right around the corner. Yep. 24th is my October? 24th. Nice. So your birthday's coming up too. We've got lots of birthdays coming up in the next month or two. Oh my goodness. All right. So we're going to go with, with our current events. And for the, today's current events, we got a couple. We got one newspaper here, the East Bay Times, which I actually greatly enjoy. The East Bay Times, I think it's a very well done news organization, news outlet. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to look over a couple stories. We're going to read some stuff, but we're going to end. We're going to end our session today with news uh, today in history, which means that since September 28th of like 1930, something big happened. So we're going to find out about that. And we're also going to do news of the weird. Weird. News of the weird. Which means something weird happens somewhere in the world, and then we're going to they, they report it on it. So it could be like a lady wrestled an alligator who had a, who tried to eat her baby. She got her baby back. <laughs> no, I made that up. But, but like a baby, a, a dingo ate my baby. Right? Remember that one from way back when? A dingo ate the lady's baby? So we're going to start off with some, um, let's see here. We're going to start with something from North Richmond, California. It says, online exhibit focuses on a historic Black community. Rare photos, video, video interviews tell a story of a proud Black neighborhood. As the population of North Richmond changes, the importance of recording and preserving its origins and history increases for Doug Harris. The history of North Richmond is important because it's the only community other than the projects on the South Side where Blacks in Richmond were, re were relegated to live after the Great Migration of World War II. Said Harris, a Berkeley-based document documentary filmmaker, Today's blacks in the community are being displaced because of gentrification. As they leave, as they leave, their story could be lost forever. So back during World War II, a lot of African Americans from the South, from the Midwest, from the East Coast, migrated to the West Coast. So they migrated from Southern California all the way up to Oregon and Washington. Why do you think that is? For jobs. Why? Because during the war. A lot, a lot of the African Americans, they weren't permitted to serve in the military, so they had to get a job doing something else. So especially women, a lot of women moved out, well, out west here from the south and the midwest and the east coast to work in to work in armament factories. Because at that time in World War II, let's say I let's say I owned a business that made 10 cans. Okay, it made 10 cans for uh, I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. I couldn't make, I have to divert my production into military production. 
So instead of making it for the public, I would now be making these canned goods for just the military. Does that make sense? Or yes. let or let's say I made um, let's say I made I made a uh, washers, washer and dryers. So instead of making washer and dryers because of the war, I would have to make something that the military could use. So instead of washers and dryers, I would be making um, like uh, components to a tank. Okay. That, so that's what that's why a lot of African Americans moved from the west, from the east coast and the, and the south to, to California, Oregon, and Washington, because there are lots and lots of jobs. And that's what made Sacramento what it is also, and Richmond and Alameda. A lot of these, a lot of these black, uh, all these African Americans, when they moved out west, especially to Northern California, they moved to places like Richmond, they moved to places like Oakland, and they moved to places uh, um, like Sacramento. Because there was the Air Force Base in Sacramento, in Sacramento, which became bigger over World War II. And a lot of the black community moved out there as well. Okay. So we're going to finish this one up. A new exhibit online at DougHarrisMedia.com backslash exhibit, an exploration of our history. The black experience in North Richmond uses rare photographs and video interviews to tell the story of the population who built a fiercely proud and independent underdog community born as a result of racism. A Zoom reception and dialogue are planned for the exhibit on October 7th. The isolated area had seen largely agricultural and industrial uses until it was designated for black residents. Many of the first houses in the community, which historically has had a high unemployment rate, were little more than shanties built from scrap lumber and other salvage materials. Other early homes were simply travel trailers on otherwise vacant lots. Yet residents preserved under the guidance of figures such as Charlie Reed, a father figure to use as the manager of recreation programs and social service organizations, such as Neighborhood House, founded in the 1950s by the Quakers America Friends Service Committee. The focus now is on trying to end systematic racism and North Richmond grew out of systematic racism, said County Supervisor John Gayola, who represents West Contra Costa County. Despite the racism and discrimination against black people, it developed a vibrant culture and community, especially today. It's important to reflect on that and understand it. Harris has produced acclaimed Bay Area history documentaries on subjects such as Glenn Burke, of Berkeley, the first openly gay player in Major League Baseball, and Byron Rumford, a Berkeley pharmacist who became a California assemblyman and wrote landmark civil rights legislation. It was Harris's time working in North Richmond that led him to documentaries. Harris, a former college and professional athlete, had followed in the footsteps of Reed as a recreation director at Shields Reed Park where he became involved for five years in a county project teaching digital media skills to teenagers. He had the use interview seniors in the community about their stories and memories of North Richmond, simultaneously teaching young people skills and exposing them to the overlooked community's history. Each year was a different crew, Harris said. The majority of the kids were on probation or came through county social services. You can see they did a masterful job. People who see the film don't know they were done by young kids. Those interviews were compiled into a series of films that now not only won awards and started Harris's documentary career, but are the, base, are the basis of the new exhibit. I think it's important to document and preserve the history of any community, especially when you train young people who are not interested in history or interacting with seniors to do this kind of work, he said. The exhibit, which includes 74 archival photos and 15 video clips, has sections on communities, businesses, people, entertainment, recreation, sports, and each with historic and current photos and short digestible video segments with the remarks of people who lived through those times. One of the things I learned doing this series about North Richmond is that it, it was a self-contained community. It had its own gas stations, restaurants, and corner stores, Harris said. North Richmond, was sort of a mecca for West Coast blues, he said. The top blues artists used, used to appear there. North Richmond was part of the circuit. The community itself included performers such as uh, Lowell Fusen and Jimmy McCracklin, 
It also hosted baseball and basketball events that were regional attractions. It's very timely. It's very timely, said Melinda McCrary, the Richmond Museum of History and Cultural Executive Director. Lesser known histories often get overshadowed by major events. The, this North Richmond history is, to com is so compelling, and right now there is a real hunger for African American history. The exhibit is funded by a city's arts and cultural grant and was created in partnership with Richmond Library and the Richmond Museum. When Doug asked if, if we would host, host it, we said, absolutely, no questions asked. McCreary said, we're giving it the platform it deserves for such a long time. Plans for, the, for opening the exhibit at the museum in the, in the spring were scuttled by, a COVID by the COVID-19 pandemic and a decision was made to go online, like so much else during the shelter in place order. The upside is that it's accessible to more, to more people and allows the addition of about double the number of mostly one of a kind photographs. It's important to know where we've been so we know where to go, Gaez said. Many of the people they talk to are now no longer with us. The population of North Richmond which is two thirds unincorporated and one third in city limits has changed over the years. And the community is now more Latino than black, which Harris says makes preserving the story of the original population all the more critical. As they leave, their, their story could be lost forever, Harris said. So it's not interesting. Mm -hmm. So the doc you're making a documentary history about the story of Richmond, like I was talking about earlier, and how people migrated here during World War II for jobs, for jobs and a better life. All right, so that was a good opening story for us. Who here likes sports? Well, the, for the Giants we did not make the playoffs, but the A's did make the playoffs. In fact, the A's will be the number two seed in the American League playoffs, and they'll be facing the White Sox sometime in the next couple days. That's baseball. That's baseball. And the 49ers won this weekend. Mm -hmm. And the Raiders lost. Well, the Raiders aren't open anymore. They're in Las Vegas. I don't think anybody's even realized that. Yeah, they're in Las Vegas now. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what we got here. Hmm. Any good stories here? So this is from the tennis world, okay? And it's about, this is about uh, one of the American players. Her name is Coco Goff. She's an African-American player who is one of the best players in the world. And she, I think she's only 19. And she's one of the best tennis players in the world right now. So golf house nice seed in debut at French Open. Williams is out. Prepping to sisters, huh? the Williams sisters, yeah. Yes. Golf is some so golf is different, but yeah, the Williams sisters were in this. Prepping in the relative warmth of a gym before heading out with leggings and long sleeves to make her French Open debut against the tournament in summer nine seed, Coco Golf got a pep talk from her dad. His goal was to be become an NBA player, and he didn't make it. He told me, you're living your dream. Not everybody gets to do that. Just have fun on the court. That really changed my perspective. This, oh, she's 16 years old. My bad, she's 16 years old. So she's still in high school. The 16 year old golf recounted, I was really nervous going into the match. That just calmed, that just calmed me down. I realized that it's just a tennis match. It's just a game. I'm doing some things that people wish they could do. So when I play professional baseball, I always had to remind myself that, that I was getting paid to play little kids game. So many people that were in the stands that were adults wished they could be in my shoes. So there was no reason for me to be upset or about anything. Cause like, Hey, I'm doing something I love, but I'm getting paid to do it. And so many people would give literally give their right leg to be in my shoes. It's all about perspective, right? On a rather unoccasional start to things at Roland Garros, postponed because of the coronavirus pandemic, day one arrived in September instead of May, with only a thousand spectators allowed instead of the more than 30,000 
as COVID-19 causes r cases rise in France. Goff offered the latest proof that she can do most of what she wishes to do on a tennis court. Using a forehand, using forehand slices to throw off her older, more experienced opponent and unbothered by her own 12 double faults, Goff stayed steady at the most crucial moments to beat Johanna Kanta 6-3, 6-3 and reach the second round. This was already Goff's fourth victory over an opponent ranked in the top 20. She's 16 years old. And she beat somebody who was 19, or sorry, who was 29 years old. So somebody 13 years her senior. Such a far cry from last year's French Open. Golf failed to make it out of qualifying while Kanta was making her way to her third Grand Slam semifinal. Soon after, Golf had her breakthrough at Wimbledon, becoming at 15 the youngest qualifier ever there on the way to the fourth round. She almost made it to the fourth round at this year's Australian Open, beating 2019 champion Naomi Osaka in route. So Naomi Osaka is also uh, an African. Um, well, she's her mom is J Japanese. Her dad is black. Her dad's American. Who was in the military? So she grew up in Japan, but she's you wouldn't know she was Japanese. She, she doesn't have a Japanese accent. But she's she's black. She's half black, half Japanese. Mm -hmm. Only recently was there a bit of was there a bit of a bump in the road for golf. She lost four or five matches before arriving in Paris, including a first round exit at the U.S. Open. When I'm on the court, I can act like I used to. I can act like I'm used to it, she said. When I'm off the court, I'm just happy to be here. Golf joked afterward about having grown up in Florida and Georgia and not being accustomed to the sort of weather this French Open is being played in, with drizzles and temperatures in the 50s. Whoa, that's cold. She figured she hadn't competed with so many layers of clothing on since she was 10. Okay, not that long ago in the, in the grand scheme of things, but still. So she hadn't competed in a long time when she was 10. That was six years ago. <laughs> Kanta, a 29-year-old from Britain, who showed up to her news conference wearing a puffy red coat, observed, kind of as rainy and windy and rubbish weather like this is, at, is the same as at home. They were not among the lucky few who got to play in the main stadium. Court Philippe Chetri, which now boasts a $55 million retractable roof, making the French Open the last Grand Slam tournament able to hold both indoor and outdoor matches. Because the roof it opens and closes the roof. So they open it, it's outdoors, they close it, it's indoors. Mm -hmm. It was much better because we could play, said top seeded Simone Halep, who stretched her winning streak to 15 matches by defeating Sara Saribis Tormo, 6 4 6 0. And the rain didn't stop us at all. Venus Williams suffered a 6 4 6 4 defeat to Slovakia's Anna Carolina. Schmidlava in the opening round. The 40-year-old has now lost in the first round at all four tournaments appearances since the season resumed following the COVID-19 shutdown, including, including this month's U.S. Open. So yeah, Venus Williams is 40 years old. And she's, yeah, she's, 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 on, she's been on the back end of her career for a while. But it was a hell of a career. Her and her sister, man. I may have started they were 16, 17, 18. So, no, they were 17 and 20 when they first started. And they took the world by storm. These two black girls crushing all yeah. these white people playing tennis. <laughs> yep. All right. So that was, that was a good, inspiring sports story. Yeah. Let's see what else we got. Let's go on the outside of sports. Ah. Let's see. Okay, let's see what's in sports is done. Let's look at our local news here. Let's see what we got. We got obituaries. We don't need to read that. No, no obituaries. So here's news from Berkeley, kind of a, it's a sad one. Police investigate homicide at home after shooting call. 
Homicide detectives are investigating the death of a man at a Berkeley Hills home after a shooting was reported there Saturday afternoon, according to police and witnesses. Police were called just after 4 p.m. to a home in the 1100 block of Glen Avenue, north of Berkeley Rose Garden, Sergeant Craig Lindau said. Dispatch logs indicate that a shooting had been reported, but Lindenau declined to confirm any cause of death. At least three people were escorted from the home, which was cordoned off by police tape for questioning, but police say they were not under arrest. Additional details were not available Saturday afternoon. Berkeley police were expected to be on the scene for most of the Saturday evening. Anyone with information about this shooting can contact the Berkeley Police Homicide Detail at 510-981-5741 or police dispatch at 510-981-5900. Mm -hmm. That's kind of stuff. They don't even know what happened. Somebody just they heard gunshots and somebody was dead. Mm -hmm. This pandemic is actually, I was, I was listening to a podcast this morning and they were talking about how because of COVID-19, suicide rates are up like a 200%. And suicide hotlines, they can't, they don't have enough people to keep up with all the suicide calls coming in. In some cities, I mean, in one city in, in, in Texas, this hospital has six cases of COVID in the hospital and 32 cases of suicide people that are on the verge of committing suicide on suicide watch in the hospital. And you got kids as young as 10 years old who are committing suicide right now. I know. Oh, it's all because they're not going to school. They can't be around friends or by themselves all the time. Humans are very social people. Humans are social creatures. We need to be around other people. And when you're not, and, and not to mention that, there's going to be over 10,000 businesses that are never going to come back. So you have people who literally put their life savings into a business. Yes. And now they got nothing because they can't open up because the, the city or state won't allow them to. They can't make any money. Nobody's giving them money. So you have some people who literally, they put their house as collateral for the business loan. So now they're gonna lose their house and their business. Mm -hmm. And some of those people are committing suicide because they're like, I can't deal with this. I mean, it's just sad. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just sad. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we'll, we'll look at the advice page, okay? okay? This one, again, it's called Ask Amy. So people, they write in, ask Amy, and they ask for her advice. Yeah, like they exactly. So dear Amy, my brother's wife has been posting a lot of racist content and wild conspiracy theories to her social media accounts. My husband and I have asked her to reconsider her positions, but she has doubled down more than once and asserted her right as a white Christian to say things, say these things. My niece, 16, said, ew, I'd never be friends with a black person. Wow. My brother told me that they would never apologize for their beliefs. My husband and I are beginning to, beginning the journey of becoming foster parents. In, in our area, 60% of children in foster care are children of color. We've told my parents that we need to cut contact with my brother's family. My mother is pushing me to let them set the record straight. I'm not comfortable forcing children of color to interact with them, knowing the kind of hate they hold in their hearts. Yes. I'm not comfortable with them around. Uh, well, I'm not comfortable with them around white children we might foster either. My parents refuse to accept this, so we are currently not speaking to them either. Do I owe my brother's family yet another chance to explain themselves, even if they promise to stop publicly stating these racist things? How can I trust them to be kind to children of color in my care? How can I have a relationship with my parents, even if I can't have one with my brothers? Oh, goodness. That's sad. I thought all that was over. Well, let's read what the response says. From Amy did write a response. Like any prospective parent, you want to childproof your surroundings to protect your children from physical or psychic harm. Just as your brother and his wife are describing their world to their daughter, you will honestly describe your world to your child. There seems little point in trying to force these people to renounce their racist ideology. They are showing you who they are. Believe them. They should not follow that. You should not follow them on social media. You should not involve your mother. You don't actually have to declare it 
and estrangement, you can simply make choices as you go. Yes, you will naturally minimize time spent with them because they seem awful and you don't like them. They don't seem to like you either. For many of us, however, the very definition of family is to occasionally share space with loudmouths, blowhards, racists, or people you simply don't like. In time, you can explain to your children why you don't like them. Re relieve your mother of her desire to mediate. Simply tell her that it is not necessary. So that is family, right? Yeah. Family are loud, they're blowhards, some of them are racist, that's just family. So you can either cut them off or you can just see them on holidays and then go your separate ways, right? Everybody's got family members they, they do not like. Ooh, that's, that's, ooh, that's sad, that's scary. All right, so let's take a look at our last page right here. Now we're gonna look at the front page of the East Bay Times. We're gonna read a story and then go to News of the Weird and Today in History. All right. Let's see here. So Trump Biden battle over quick confirmation. So if you don't know, this is a big weekend. On Friday, Donald Trump, well, if you know last week that the, the Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg died. He's one of the Supreme Court justices. She passed away last week. So she a black she's, a, she's a white Jewish lady. But as of this Friday, Donald Trump came out and said he's, he's, he's nominated a person to take her spot, which is Amy Conan Barrett. Okay, but people are, are, don't like her because they say she's too religious. She's conservative and she's too religious, which means if she comes to the place, she's going to magically get rid of Roe versus Wade and take away people's health care. That's their side of the story. Okay, so we're going to read this. Okay, so again, Trump Biden battle over quick confirmation. President Donald Trump said Sunday, that confirmation of his Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, will go quickly, but his Democratic rival, Joe Biden, implored the Republican-led Senate to hold off on voting on her nomination until after the November 3rd election to let, people, to let the people decide. Speaking at a news conference at the White House, Trump spotlighted Barrett's Roman Catholic religion, portraying her as a victim of attacks on her faith. But it's her conservative approach to the law, particularly health care, that is drawing opposition from Democrats, not her private beliefs. It's a, it's a disgrace, Trump said. He vowed she will be confirmed very quickly. It's a disgrace. She will be confirmed very quickly. That's my impression, Donald Trump. <laughs> very quickly, she'll be confirmed. Why? Why will she be confirmed? Because she is the greatest justice that will ever be, the biggest, the greatest, the grandest justice that will ever be, second to me. <laughs> All right. Tr Trump's, uh, Trump's announcement of Bear for the seat held by the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is launching a high stakes, fast track election season fight over confirmation of a conservative judge who is expected to shift the court rightward as it reviews health care, abortion access, and other hot button topics, issues. Biden on Sunday appealed directly to his former colleagues in the Senate to take a step back from the brink. Biden urged Senate Republicans not to fan a conservative a controversy during an already tumultuous election year for a country reeling from the coronavirus crisis, a struggling economy, and protest over racial injustice. If Trump wins the election, his nominee should have a vote, Biden said. But if he wins the presidency, he should choose the next justice. This is time, this is time to de-escalate, Biden said in Wilmington, Delaware. No justice has ever been confirmed to the Supreme Court so close to the presidential election, with early voting already underway in some states. Republicans believe the fight ahead will boost voter um, enthusiasm for Trump and Senate Republicans at serious risk of losing their majority. Democrats warn Barrett's confirmation would almost certainly undo America's health care 
protections as the court takes up a case against the Aff Affordable Care Act in the fall. According to a national poll by the New York Times and Siena College that was released Sunday, a clear majority, 56% of voters believe that the winner of the November 3rd presidential election should fill Ginsburg's seats versus 41% who said that Trump should as the current president. Biden has said he would nominate the first black woman to the court, but he has not released the names of this potential of his potential choices. The poll, which was conducted on September 22nd through the 24th, had a margin of sampling error of 3.5 percentage points. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi declined to say Sunday whether Barrett, a judge on the 7th U.S. Circuit District of Appeals, is qualified to serve. But she argued that Trump was moving quickly to fill the vacancy before the court bears a challenge to the Affordable Care Act on November 10th. It is not. It's not about this justice. It's about any justice he would appoint right now, Pelosi said on CNN State, the Nation, State of the Union with Jake Tapper. What am I concerned about? What I, what I am concerned about is anyone that the president would have appointed was there to undo the Affordable Care Act. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell had said the Senate will vote on Barrett's nomination in the weeks ahead. Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Lindsey Graham said confirmation hearings will begin October 12th and a vote is expected by October 29th. The Senate will confirm her next month, said Senate Senator Tom Cotton, Republican of Arkansas, with only, two of the, with only two of the 53 Republican senators voting in opposition to a confirmation vote before the November 3rd election, Democrats appeared outnumbered and without recourse to block the nomination. So yeah, the Democrats have no way to block the nomination unless Republicans jump ship and vote to not nominate her. So it's definitely gonna be a, um, interesting. Sure. Yep. All right, so now we're going to do news of the weird and today in history. Okay. First, we're going to do news of the weird, and this one's called collectibles. September 22nd was the 60th anniversary of 14-year-old Boy, Boy Scout Steve Jean scoring a memento of Vice President Richard Nixon's visit to the Gene's hometown of Sullivan, Illinois. Nixon took a bite of a buffalo barbecue sandwich and left it. I looked around and thought, if no one else was going to take it, I'm going to take it. Gene told the Herald and Review, and the leftovers have been in a jar in Gene's freezers ever since. In 1988, the sandwich got Gene a spot on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and led to his acquiring, led to his acquiring half-eaten items from Carson and fellow guest Steve Martin, as well as Tiny Tim and Henny Youngman. So wow, he collected a half-eaten sandwich from Nixon from 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> from 1984 or something like that. Wow. What, what kind of sandwich? It was a what kind of sandwich? It was a buffalo barbecue sandwich that Nixon had taken one bite of. And the 14-year-old was like, well, hell, I'll take it. He put in a jar and it's been in that jar ever since. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. So now we're going last but not least today in history. So if we remind ourselves, today is Monday, September 28th, 2020. So now we're going to turn the clock and we're going to go back in time to Monday, September 28th of 1920. So members of the Chicago White Sox were indicted for allegedly throwing the 1919 World Series. The eight were acquitted, 
but were banned from, from baseball for life. So if you don't remember that, they're called the, the Chicago Black Sox. They call them that because they were black ball from baseball because um, an outside source came in during the World Series and paid some of the players to purposely lose the game. Some of the players had second thoughts and still played as hard as they could. And then it came out that they tried to rig the game and these eight players were banned from baseball for life. The most famous is Shoeless Joe Jackson. That's the most famous person, but yeah. So imagine a bunch of 20 year old kids, this guy come up and says, if you purposely lose the World Series, you each get $10,000. In 1920, $10,000? That's a million dollars. Oh my goodness, that's like five years salary yes. for most people, jeez. More than that, it's like 10 years salary for most people. Man, you could buy a house, a couple cars. Man. So again, on September, on Monday, or September 28th, 1928, Scottish medical researcher Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, the first effective antibiotic. So yeah, Fleming, you've been a penicillin which has saved literally billions of lives since he, since he did that. Because there is, like, especially during World War I and the Civil War, if there had been penicillin there, they, they could have saved like 70% more lives. Because a lot of people died from infection. Yes. A lot of people died in war. They didn't die from actual getting shot. It was the infections that set in. Right. So let's say I got shot in the arm and it wasn't life-threatening at all. But it's in the Civil War, I got shot in the arm. And it went through, and I was like, oh, I got shot in the arm. Well, that didn't kill me. It was the infection, because it wasn't cleaned properly, that yeah. killed me, which made the arm turn uh, gang green, yeah. which means they would have to cut it off. But if they were too late, that gang green would then go into your bloodstream and go into your heart, and you die. Mm -hmm. And back then, they didn't have any anesthetics during the, war, during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So when they cut off people's limbs, what was their painkiller? nothing they gave him some whiskey they had him drink some whiskey and and they would put a, a piece of wood board in their mouth to, to bite on while the doctor would take a saw and cut off their arm or their leg and this is before they knew about germs so basically they would cut off the guy's arm or leg and without even cleaning the saw they'd bring the next guy up and start cutting off his arm or leg without even cleaning anything so a lot of people died, even though they got their arms cut off and the infection was gone, they died from the ensuing infection yes. from, the, from the, 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 the saw that was infected by, so that wasn't people. clean. I mean, just uh, horrible. Mm. So penicillin saved literally billions of lives since it's been invented. So September 28th, 1962, a federal appeals court from Mississippi a federal appeals court found Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett in civil contempt for blocking the admission of James Meredith, a black student, to the University of Mississippi. Federal marshals escorted Meredith onto the campus two days later. So I didn't know that. Yeah. So James Meredith was, was a black student who was yes, got admitted was. to the University of Mississippi yes, in 1962. So that was a very racist time. Yeah. So those people in Mississippi did not want him on there. But the U.S. Marshals. the state of Mississippi College. University of Mississippi. Yes. Yep. So the U.S. Marshals had to escort him onto campus. That must have been so scary and for him. would be right there when he. Yelling all kinds of words at him and all kinds of bad. But man, that's scary. Oh, that was just ridiculous. Oh, My dad used to say that. He, every day he brought home the newspaper saying something about James Mary. You know. Really? Yes. Man. That was rough. All right, so September 28th, 2000. After a 12-year battle, the government approved use of the abortion pill, RU486. There you go. I don't know what that is, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me. I got nothing to say on that because I don't know what it is. Usually I have something to say about everything. Like I said, I should, I should go on Jeopardy. So again, thank you everybody for joining me for our current events today. <laughs> on this lovely Monday, September 28th, 2020. My name is Diallo. I will see you next time. Have a beautiful, wonderful Monday day. You are welcome, Frank. 
Annie and Wayne. Oh, 